If we're being honest, it's not always easy to live out our Christian faith. From time to time, uh, though we try to be faithful, we walk uh, in integrity consistently as often as we can, there are those times when we find ourselves a bit discouraged, maybe disheartened over maybe the conditions of the world that we're living in, that we're living out our faith in. Uh, we may find ourselves sort of pressed down and weighed down by, um, you know, maybe uh, tribulation, persecution, uh, opposition, um, oppression. Um, some suffer with depression and that kind of a thing. And sometimes uh, whatever those factors might be that kind of contribute to the difficult uphill climb that it sometimes can be to live out our faith, there is great encouragement in knowing that that has been the experience of believers throughout history. Not just in the New Testament times, but also in the Old Testament times as well. Yeah, Jesus uh, said to his disciples in John 16, 33, as he was imparting to them in the hours prior to his arrest, uh, really kind of his last few hours with his disciples, his closest friends, uh, one of whom had just left uh, going to betray him. Um, but with those that remained, the 11 that were still there, he poured into them. And one of the things that he shared with them is that in this world, you will have tribulation. There's going to be hard times. There's going to be difficulty. Going uphill for uh, some of this journey is going to be just part and parcel with the Christian faith. However, he didn't just leave it there. He also coupled it with the idea that we could be of good cheer. Why? Because he has overcome the world. And so that great encouragement would be something they would lean on and would hold on to in the days ahead when they would learn what it was like to uh, live out their ministries, to serve him uh, without him physically walking with them as he had to that point. Um, but that kind of thing was not just common to the disciples, the apostles in the New Testament. We find when we look at Hebrews chapter 11 that this has been the experience of, uh, of so many, I would dare even say all, who have sought to uh, follow after the Lord uh, in the times in which they lived, whether it be Abraham, whether it be any of the prophets, whether it be Job, whether it be any of those that tried to walk with consistency with the Lord. It was always, um, uh, all of them, I should say, at some point or another faced um, some kind of uphill traversing. Well, it's, it's not only encouraging to know that this is a common experience for believers and that you can take courage in knowing you're not alone. As a matter of fact, um, chapter 11 of Hebrews is supposed to be an encouragement to us. As a matter of fact, I'd like to have you turn your attention to Hebrews chapter 12 because Hebrews chapter 12 picks up on that encouragement that the author was speaking about in chapter 11. Uh, chapter 11 may in some respects not read as a great encouragement because after all, who wants to know that hard times are going to come and even tremendous persecution might come. But to know that you're not in it alone, but that this has been common to the experience of those before and is the common experience of those, so many of those around us today. And the author here, uh, who we don't really know who it is, it's generally, uh, it's most often ascribed to Paul, I should say, but we don't actually know who wrote the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, there's some uh, of, the, of the letter that uh, linguistically seems like it could have been written by Paul, but there's a lot of places in it that also seem to indicate it was written by somebody else. So we don't really know. But we do know ultimately the Holy Spirit was behind it, whoever the human author was. But coming out of chapter 11, this hall of faith as we often call it, uh, the author goes on in chapter 12 and says this, Therefore, and as a brief biblical um, uh, uh, hermeneutic tip, um, when you see the word therefore, you always want to stop and ask yourself, What's it there for? And so the reason it's here is because it is continuing the thought of gaining encouragement from those who walked faithfully, even in the face of persecution before, those listed in chapter 11. And so therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, those he's just been writing about, let us also, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely or which so easily besets us, as some of your versions might say. And he says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter, the author and finisher. Uh, again, as some of our English translations put it, the author and finisher, founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him. Jesus, that is, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Uh, you know, Jesus is always the one 
who is the supreme example of this, of the idea of the one who uh, facing the greatest persecution. And think about that for a minute. It wasn't just those that opposed him, whether it was the scribes and Pharisees, um, the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin under, after his arrest and that. Uh, it was also uh, even one of his closest friends, uh, Judas, the, one of those who had followed him most closely throughout the uh, throughout the gospel era, his ministry, I should say. And so, uh, and he ultimately turns on him. Not only that, and of course, this isn't persecution, but Peter himself, uh, arguably his very closest friend, was somebody who, um, you know, in a moment of, of human frailty and weakness, denied him three times. Um, ultimately, he's handed over to the Romans, where he's abused and crucified. Uh, at the hands of sinful men. And so, and not only that, but if you even consider on top of that, that as he is on the cross, nails in his hands and feet, a uh, crown of thorns having been put on his head and having been struck in the head with this crown of thorns on, uh, all of the suffering that he endured physically. On top of that, uh, there was the mocking of the crowd and all of these kinds of things. Those yelling, Hosanna, just a week earlier are now crying out, crucify him. And then on top of all of that, he looks to the Father up in heaven and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, of course, the answer to that question is so that you and I would not have to be forsaken. But for that brief moment, and the only one in all of eternity, the Son was separated from the Father in some way that we can't begin to understand. But for him, our inability to understand it also brings with it the inability to truly understand what it felt like for him in that moment to be separate. We can't imagine how hard and painful and difficult that must have been, but such was the cost of our redemption and Jesus willingly paid it. Well, when the author says, consider him who endured such suffering, he is the supreme example of one who faced that persecution, but was faithful to complete that work that he came to do. And he becomes now our template, our prototype, our, 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 the one we view, the one we keep in our sights to say, okay, this is the one who did it. This is what it can look like. And he encourages us to do the same. Um, again, earlier in the same passage, he says, let us run the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the founder, uh, the author and finisher of our faith, the one who is the all in all, the beginning and end of our faith. Some have actually seen in that passage um, sort of the picture of a trailblazer, the one who goes before and, and breaks the trail, cuts it open so that we have a path on which to follow. I think that's a great word picture that is kind of uh, drawn out of that passage. Um, and even that's, uh, before that, as we do this, let us cast off every weight and sin, anything that would make it harder for us to run this race. Uh, in much the same way that an athlete might wear some weights and stuff in that in order to train for the race, they would never dream of running the race with those weights on, with anything that would encumber or hinder. And so likewise, when we consider anything in our lives, some of it is sin. Like there may very well be something that we're living in right now that is wholly displeasing to God. Well, of course, that's going to slow us down in our running of this race, as it's referred to. Uh, but it may not just be overt sin. It might be some distraction. You know, again, to borrow from the uh, uh, illustration of an athlete, uh, an athlete who trains and conditions their body for, uh, for a race or a competition in some, uh, some form, uh, forsakes things that keep them from attaining their goal. Uh, they, they eat things that will help and they avoid those things that don't. They get up early and train and they go to bed early so they can get up early to train. So therefore, maybe they don't watch all the TV shows that their friends are all watching because they're devoted to getting exactly the right rest, exactly the right time to work out, putting exactly into this pursuit all that it demands of them because it's worth it. Uh, much like G it says here of Jesus who... Uh, looking past the cross and even despising its shame, yet for the glory that lay beyond, he endured the cross and all of this. Uh, in other words, in, in, uh, without minimizing or diminishing what Jesus accomplished, let me just put it in a way that maybe helps us understand. The prize that lay beyond, the suffering and the pain that stood in between, or on the path to getting there, I should say, 
was worth enduring for the sake of what was beyond. And I think within that, as we consider him and these things about him and his commitment to doing that which the Father had given him faithfully and completely, we see in this the beautiful example that we can follow. Uh, The encouragement to recognize that it is worth it to go through the things in this life that we go through ultimately, that we might find ourselves one day at the end of this race having completed it. Uh, even as Paul would say to Timothy, I have, uh, I have run my course, I have uh, finished the race, I have kept the faith, right? Uh, this great triad of accomplishment and, and having just simply pressed on. Now, we're not talking about simply salvation. That is an established, finished work at the cross. Jesus said it is finished, and he didn't say almost. I mean, our salvation is done based on what he ultimately accomplished at the cross. All that remains is for us to believe. So what we're talking about here is not coming to salvation. It's talking about running the race as a saved person, uphill though it may be, with obstacles and hurdles, to borrow from the running analogy, uh, hurdles in the, in the path as there may be, running the race to win. Um, Paul in Philippians chapter 3 refers to this as pressing on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, uh, laying aside anything and pressing anything that would, would hinder, but pressing on uh, to the high call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the encouragement for the believer. This is the call of the believer to uh, embrace and engage um, in spite of the difficulties that come. Uh, Again, just one more time on the analogy of the athlete. When the athlete runs or pushes their way through, I'll just stick with the runner analogy. Uh, And I am no runner per se, you know, in terms of literally running out, going out running marathons and stuff. But those who do, they, they, they recognize that there is such relief in the joy of finishing that race. Whether you come in first or last, you finish. And though the pain is great, though the muscles ache, and though the chest is heavy, and though the, the mind starts to just get just you know, whatever happens to your mind when you're running long distances and you're getting fatigued and all these kinds of things, they continue to press on because at the end they can say they finished. There is, it's worth the pain to get through. Well, the Christian life is not one where we compete with one another, but it's about finishing and finishing well. Uh, There is a, at the end of it all, a crown laid up uh, that the Lord gives to those uh, ultimately that are his, those we have, and of course, by virtue of finishing the race, we know we are his, right? I mean, we're, uh, we understand that just goes part and parcel with being a child of God. But the idea of running this race, recognizing that whatever stands in your way in the course of things, we press through because this is the race we're called to run. It's for the high call of God in Christ Jesus. Um, you can do it. You know, uh, in uh, I think it's what's Galatians 6, 9, you know, don't grow weary in doing good. In other words, don't let your service to the Lord um, cease through weariness, but press on. Sometimes it feels exhilarating to be a child of God, up on the mountaintop, seeing things in those moments where we're so close to the Lord that, uh, that everything just seems to just be right and good and, 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 we're, and we're just experiencing sort of this mountaintop high with the Lord. But a lot of our races run in the valley. A lot of our race is running through the valley of the shadow of death, if you will. And yet, through like David, we know that God is with us through it. And so, therefore, we fear no evil. We continue to make our way through it. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. As I was thinking of this passage today, I thought about kind of breaking it down into a, a full Bible study kind of a thing. But I, I found myself just encouraged by it. And I thought I would just share these rudimentary thoughts with you just simply as an encouragement. Uh, to take time to recognize that you're not alone in this race. There is a whole cloud of witnesses that has gone on before. And not only that, but there are believers who run alongside of us right now. We, we uphold each other and carry each other through. Uh, some of you have seen that, uh, any, any one of the number of examples of uh, those marathons where somebody collapses at some point just before the finish line and another runner at sacrificing his own time stops to help that runner and they go across the finish line together. Sometimes that's how we 
make our way through this path, through this course and everything, either being the one helped or maybe stopping to help somebody else. It's not a competition against somebody in our race. It's just simply about running it and finishing it. So be encouraged by that. Be encouraged to know that you can do it, that God is with you, that there is, um, there is great joy in knowing that you're running this race, that at the end of it, Jesus is standing there ready to welcome you home. Well done, good and faithful servant. But as we run, have our eyes on him, that one that we'll see at the finish line, who blazed the trail for us, who went before us, and the countless number that have also uh, run this race prior. They set the example and the tone, and they let us know that it's possible. We can do this too. So don't be discouraged. Even in your moments where you feel like you're just trashed, you're just done, you're exhausted, and you want to give up, don't. Continue on and know that the Lord will give you strength to do so, just as he did with so many of those heroes of the faith before. It wasn't just in their own strength, but the Lord was with them as they ran. Uh, So know this, you're not alone. Believers are alongside of you, praying for you. Maybe this is a word for somebody. I guess I'm just realizing that maybe there's someone out there right now that is just at that place and they need to hear this word from the Lord, uh, hear hear from his word. And so let those words sink in. Embrace them, let them sink into your heart, and let them encourage you to continue to press on, especially in the days ahead. And I'll end on this thought. As the world continues to move in the direction that it is, which is decidedly against what God would have had for it, if we would have all simply, the whole world would have been obeying. But that kingdom, when it comes, is in stark contrast to the kingdoms of this world right now. That will one day become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. As the world continues down that re- down that road, on the one hand, it will get harder and harder and harder to be a light for all men to see and glorify our Father in heaven as we continue to do these good works in his name. But on the other hand, the darker it gets, the brighter our light becomes. And so if I can borrow from Warren Wearsby, just remember it's always too soon to quit. Continue on, press on. I'll actually quote my uh, my friend at church too. Who's, uh, she's a wonderful poet, lyricist, and I've shared this before, but I feel like it's the kind of thing that, that uh, I don't think you can wear out. Uh, But she wrote, press in and press on. What a good word. So let me encourage you. Press into him. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, as you press on toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Father, we just want to thank you. What a beautiful and wonderful opportunity you've given us to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, who blazed the trail for us, who cut the path, led the way, and invites us to come and to follow him. We thank you, Father, that as we walk this race, as your children, we don't have to wonder if you're with us. We know you're with us. We know that you give strength where it's needed. Help us to embrace that strength and for our part, just to continue to press on with tenacity, knowing that that at the end of it all, There is this beautiful welcoming home, this beautiful entering into the joy of our Lord. The work will be done, and the time to rest will have arrived. So, Father, we thank you. We bless you. We praise you. And for whatever part you've called us to play in the days ahead leading up to Jesus' return, help us to have a mindset determined to do it faithfully, that you might be glorified, and that our lives might count not just for time, but even for eternity. Father, we love you and praise you. We thank you. We give ourselves to you and ask you to use us in the power of the Holy Spirit and in Jesus' name. Amen.